new year, I, I don't know if you're like me, but I imagine you are in some ways, that there are times. There are times in this life where we feel kind of boxed in, you know, where not only necessarily by what others have done to you, but sometimes it's because of the choices we make, and we feel like we're kind of cornered, and our life is shrinking. We're in one of those rooms where the walls are starting to close in on us, and we have limitations on our life. There's things that we can't do, and many times it's a result of actions that we took in the past. You know, when I, like King David, for instance, you know, we know that he was a man who was after God's own heart. The Bible says he, he was called and anointed as a king in his youth, just as a, a little child. But David himself made a huge mistake and committed adultery and then compounded it with murder and cover up and lying. And as a result of that, his life was shrunk on him. And he had enormous limitations that came. Even though he was the king of Israel in their golden years, the limitations on his own personal life and death within his own family was a direct result of that sin. And yet we know that David found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that he became known as this man who had a passion for God and whose heart was like God, filled with passion for him and for others. Now this morning... I want you to take a look here at Philippians 3 with me because this is a situation where Paul was writing from prison facing his own execution and he looked back and he looked back at his life and he saw this host of negative experiences from his youth and he saw these positive experiences that he had as a result of that old experience when he met Jesus face to face and all of a sudden he was changed. And just a few verses before we get to this passage that we're reading today, beginning in in, uh, verse number 4, just a few verses from that point uh, through verse 7, he tells us some of the limitations that are a result of the the life that he lived. And he says this in verse 4, If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You know, as we move into this text here this morning, Paul gives us four steps And I want us to take a hard look at these, beginning down in verse 12. Four steps for living beyond ourselves. Because sometimes our life gets too narrow. We we forget, how do I get out of this? I'm so trapped by the past. What can I do to look forward? We spend so much time staring into the rearview mirror at life, looking back at all of our failures, and even some of the successes that we try to live in in the good old days, and we forget that, wait a minute, we've still got breath. We're still here for a purpose. God can still use us today. And so I want to, want us to look at how do we, how do we get to, to the place where we can live beyond the circumstances of our life and live actually beyond ourselves. Now, the the first thing that we have to do is to face the fact, and I know this is hard for many of you, face the fact that we're not perfect. You're not perfect. You know, news flash. You know, and, and if you think you are, just ask your wife if it's true. Or your husband if it's true. You know, it's a question that they can probably give a better answer to than we can ourselves. And the reality is that none of us are perfect, are we? I, I don't know about you. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself. But it's important that we find the humility to admit that we aren't perfect. Paul didn't lack self-confidence, not by a long shot. But listen to what he says here in verses 12 and 13. He says, "Not, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. This is a man who was just inches away from becoming St. Paul, the author of the biggest share of the New Testament. I mean, in the classical, traditional sense, 
Paul was kind of the foundation person of the New Testament church. And he's soon to become one of the veterans of the faith. An apostle born out of season. One, one who had encountered Jesus Christ face to face. Knocked him flat off his donkey and blinded him on that road to Damascus. Yet in the last weeks of his life, he doesn't think that he's made it on his own. I mean, he's quick to realize that it had nothing to do with him. He's facing up to the fact that he is not perfect. And he's encouraging us to do the same. Our, our society has a tendency to lean on glass crutches. You know, we, we, these glass crutches, they, they can very well support your weight. But if, if somebody throws a cement block at you and breaks one of those crushes or crutches and it shatters, all of a sudden we find out that it will not support us and we fall. You know, Horatio, Al Horatio Alger wrote Rags to Riches novels. Some of you have heard about them. Some of you were there when they came out. No, <laughs> but no, it was in the 19th century. But he wrote these, and, and following his example, we live in this Rags to Riches society. I mean, this is America, after all, the land of opportunity. This is the place where a man can pull himself up by his own bootstraps. He can become anything he was willing to believe in and put his mind to and work hard at. In fact, there's even a Horatio Alger Society in America today that awards self-made people every year. They give out awards to people who are self-made men. But if you stop and think about it, there really is no one who is self-made. No one. Every one of us, we at least had a mother and father, even if we don't know who they were, right? We were all made by someone. We're all a product of our environment. We all come from someplace. And it's important for us to understand that we didn't get where we are on our own. We didn't get there. We're not perfect. You know, the Swiss psychiatrist, Dr. Paul Tournier, in his book, The Strong and the Weak, Tournier says that every one of us is both strong and weak. Those of us in whom strength is the dominant feature, we get rewarded for that strength. Those of us for whom weakness is the dominant feature, get put down because of that weakness. But he says both strength and weakness are neurotic, and both can become out of kilter. He says if weakness leads to a sense of failure, strength too has a vicious cycle. One must go on being stronger and stronger. It's like you have to continue to prove yourself if you're strong for fear of suffering an even more crushing defeat. And this race for strength leads humanity inevitably to general collapse. If all we're worried about is proving ourselves strong over others, then that means that what we're doing is putting them down and it's a source of conflict in our lives. It can't be about just strength. It can't be about just weakness. But he goes on to say that the truth is that human beings are much more alike than they think. All of us are very similar. We put on appearances we, we put on a personality, but inside many of us struggle with the very same insecurities. This external mass or outward reaction that we have to circumstances around us, it's really just a persona. It's just a facade. It's just what we, the way that we interact with those around us. And that's true for the strong and the weak. All people, in fact, are weak. And all are weak because we're all afraid. We're all afraid of the same thing. We're afraid that our weaknesses are going to be discovered by other people. That the real us is going to come out. And so as a result of that, people walk around trying to put on something that they're not. And we all have secret faults. You know, we, we all have a bad conscience on some level on account of certain facts that we know that no one else knows about us. And all are afraid. They're afraid of God. They're afraid of themselves. They're afraid of life or death. And it's important for us to acknowledge before God that we are not perfect. We're not. That's, that's where it starts. That's where our faith in God starts. If we think we can do it, the Bible said it real clearly, the reason that he had to die for us and it had to be a gift of faith was so that men would not boast in themselves, that they would not say that they somehow earned this salvation. Do you get it? You didn't earn your salvation in Jesus Christ. It was a pure gift of God. It was grace. It was out of his love for you. And it wasn't an earned love. He saw you in the situation you were in. He loved you enough to die for you. And because of his death, 
we can live in his resurrection. And that, folks, is the best news there is. But it has to start with us acknowledging the fact that we're not perfect, that our faith must come from him. And then the second thing, if you want to live beyond yourself, the second thing you have to do is that you have to live with your back to the past. You have to live with your back to the past. You know, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, we should forget what lies behind. And you might protest, well, you know, we shouldn't quickly forget because many of the great lessons of life come from the mistakes we've made in the past. You know, and, and, and from a, maybe from a psychotherapeutic way, we have to learn how to first deal with those things from the past before we can get beyond them. And in some ways, that's true. You know, living with your back to the past doesn't mean choosing to ignore real issues that come up in your life that you need to deal with. But our message is based upon the cross of Jesus Christ. God created humankind, and we chose to disobey him. And subsequently, as a, as a result of that, all of us fell, and we're all subject to original sin. None of us is perfect. And God responded to that situation we found ourselves in by breaking into human history. He came in when we just talked about it with the Advent, with the Christmas season. You know, we, we've got a faith that's based on acknowledging that we've done wrong, and we remember what God has done for us. That's where it starts. It was, it's when we experience grace. God's unconditional, unearned grace. When we learn that he took upon himself our sins and we begin to understand that it had nothing to do with us, what, what do we need to forget? We need to forget the sins that we've dumped at the cross. You know, one of the things that people do is that they keep going back and back and back. Some people struggle with the temptation side of sin. Temptation is not sin. You know, I, I've said before, the question often comes up, are, are, uh, is homosexuality, is it a born trait or is it, a, is, it, is it based upon decisions and training and that kind of stuff? Does it come out of the culture or is it something you're born into? Well, I believe that it is something you're born into in, in this respect, and that is that everybody has a tendency to sin in some regard. And we all do. It may be kleptomania. It may be that it, it's gossip or it may be whatever your temptation is to sin. I believe that it's stronger in some than it is in others. What you're tempted with is not the same thing I'm tempted with. And there are people out there that are tempted into homosexual sin. Does that mean that they should respond to it? No more than someone should rob a liquor store in order to get money. We have, to, we have to stand against, and a lot of this has to do with the morality of the Bible. We stand where God stands. We listen to what he has to say, and we do it according to his will, even though it's opposed, many times, to our own feelings. And I mean, you know exactly what I'm talking about, because you've been tempted in certain ways in your life. And we have to push back against that temptation. You know, we resist the devil. You know, you know, he says, if you resist him, he'll flee from you. If you don't resist him, he'll own you. So we, our lives are a matter of us saying, God, I, I understand that I've got this temptation in my life, but I'm standing against it. And in the times that I failed, I take those things to the cross of Jesus Christ and I give them to him. And I don't pick them back up again. You know, one of the problems we have is that in Romans 12, 1 and 2, he tells us that we're to be living sacrifices. That's, that's a real problem. You know, I wish sometimes that it was dead sacrifices because at least we know that we'd stay there at the altar. But unfortunately, we're living sacrifices. We offer ourselves to him completely as we live. That means that we die to ourselves and our own wants, but we live to Christ. But the trouble is because we're still living, we can still fall. We can slide back into those old patterns again. And he's telling us, no, that's not what it's all about. Those things that you brought to the altar, leave them there. Leave them there. You know, and, and once you do that and you begin to understand it, then you'll see that there is strength in the grace that God gives us when we can learn how to leave our sins there at the cross. The scripture says that as far as the east is from the west, so far have our transgressions been removed from us. The German poet Goethe said, The glorious fact is not that the past is solely dirty and unclean, but that the future is unsullied. You hear what he's saying? He's saying, folks, the potential that you have in your life from this point on is wonderful. It's beautiful. It's awesome. 
No one can even tell what you're capable of if you'll just simply give what you have to God and leave it there. And the sin in your life, you don't have to pick it up and wear it again. You leave it at the cross and just follow Him. And we need to forget the negative, but sometimes we need to forget the positive as well. You know, Gordon McDonald one time explained that he tried to figure out what he liked about some elderly people that made him stand out from otherly, other elderly people he knew. And he concluded that the people that he enjoyed the most were the ones who weren't always reminiscing about the past. But instead, we're talking about the present and the future. And some of us have accomplishments in our past that we feel we can never replicate. And it's crucial for us, and I mean absolutely crucial, for us to live today realizing our future is ahead of us. There is more that you're called to do here for God, no matter how old you are. Otherwise, you'd be home right now with Him. If God has given you breath, and you can tell every morning when you get up, I challenge you, walk into your bathroom, lean close to the mirror, and breathe on it. If there's fog that comes out, you know that God has called you to do His work for one more day. There's, we are His. He's invested us in this planet to bring a return to His kingdom. The question is, are we doing what He's called us to do? Are we living for today? Or do we spend our whole time thinking about all the great days that were behind us? I'm telling you, there are great days ahead of you. I don't care if you're 9 or 99. The same thing is true. There are great days ahead of you in Christ if you'll only grab hold of His hand and trust Him to see you through them. You know, I, I, having a, one of the things that we can do, this is a third point, is that we can have a worthwhile goal. You know, the Apostle Paul writes there in verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, with, with that phrase in mind, it, is your goal one-dimensional? Or does it have an upward dimension to it? Are the things that you've determined that you want to accomplish in your life, are they just for you and on this level? Or is some of it for God on His level? What are we doing here? Do we have an upward call in our lives? Understand this. If you're not pursuing an upward call, if you're not pursuing an upward call, then, then you're playing the commodities market. And let, let, me, let me explain it from an illustration from way back. This, this is way back. We're talking 70s. How many of you were alive in the 70s? There's a few of us. All right. Just a few of us. Bridget Bardot. Anybody remember that name? Bridget Bardot. She was this, I don't know, sex image person from back in the day. And... and, and um, when she was at the height of her career, and she was asked by Vogue magazine what her definition of getting old was, and she said, the day that I can no longer have the man I'd like. And the interview, interviewer then asked what she looked for in a man, that he attracts me physically, she said. And she went on to describe herself as the most important sex symbol of her time. But, but a bit upset, she said, Time will destroy me one day as it destroys everything, but no one else will be Bardot. I'm the only Bardot, and my species is unique. And what she did is she objectified herself, and she made a commodity of herself. She saw herself as a commodity, as a sex symbol commodity, and she realized that she was already past her prime. Twenty years later, she wrote in her autobiography, I think about death every day. It's the decomposition that gets me. You spend all your time making your body look so good, and then you just rot away like that. When we play the commodities market, we can make a lot of money fast, but we can lose a lot of money fast. And ultimately, when you play the commodities market, you always lose. You're going to lose. There's a better way, and that's living with an upward goal where you begin to realize that God is the one who's in control of your life and He's got a plan for you that is glorious. You don't have to live up to what you're trying to make yourself look like. How ridiculous and how vain that is because one day, just like she discovered, you're going to be rotting away in some casket somewhere. So what was the point of taking all this time and effort and money and worrying about what other people thought when in the end she's just some wormy, moldy mass? If that's all there is, 
and we just commodify ourselves. Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> if we make ourselves into a commodity and, and we just try to become everything we can here with no upward goal, it counts for nothing. But I've known people, and this is the tragedy. A lot of people don't get this. Probably one of the best examples I know was, was Bert Evans. I've talked about him before. One of my early, one of my mentors when I was new in the minute, relatively new in the ministry. He came on our staff in Grand Rapids when he was 78, I want to say. About 78 years old, he came on our staff. And he was the minister of counseling. And he came on our staff as the minister of counseling when he was 78 years old. He'd already retired twice. He retired from Ann Arbor. He, he actually built the Grand Ann Arbor First Church. He, he went to Muskegon, pastor up there at Central Assembly for a while, retired again, and then he came to work for us on the staff. He was 78 years old when he started. He worked there for about eight years until he was 86 and retired again. But even in his second retirement, he was still doing things for Wayne Benson, our senior pastor. He was still doing some things for him on the side. But the thing is about Bert was that he was always looking for something more. He was reading, and he'd come share what he read. He developed this curriculum called Paraclete for, that was a counseling training curriculum that was absolutely detailed, wonderful, exhaustive research, all these footnotes and books that went into this thing. It was brilliant, and it was well done. He was 80-some years old, and he's still writing contemporary stuff. And Burr would come down to my office often with something he'd read in a book or a Bible, or, and he'd say, Larry, look at this, listen to this, like a little kid who'd just been saved for a week, and he was just giddy about something that he'd just read because he was about doing things for God. And he stayed young. He was, how old was he when he passed? 94, I want to say? He was like 94 up until the week before he died. He was still writing letters for Wayne. He was still, he was still doing this stuff and researching things and, and absolutely living life. And how many of us, we don't have that kind of a goal. We don't have something that has an upward call to it. And we think somehow our goal in life is to head to the villages in Florida. And I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. Why? What, what possible satisfaction can there be about sitting around all day doing nothing but playing golf and watching TV when there are things we can do for the kingdom that are eternal, that will make an eternal difference? Let me, let me clue you in on something, guys. There's no golf course in heaven. There's no fishing stream. There's no hunting rifles. None of that stuff is there. So give it up right now. And I'm telling you, don't worry about that stuff. Start looking at the eternal. Start looking at the things that matter in people's lives. Start looking to, to show kids, young people. I talked to you about how important it is for us to have people working in our children's ministries. Start showing them that there is something to live for in life. And that it doesn't end. That I'm just as excited today about living for God as I was when I was first saved. And that nothing changes. You know, I, I want to go down the road like Ralph back here. How old are you, Ralph, now? 96? 95. How old are you, Ralph? 96. 96 years old, still going strong for God, still reading the Word, still sharing it with everybody he meets. Listen, guys, we can do that. Or you can go out as some kind of a fat slob on the couch, you know, watching TV when you're 68. I'm telling you, it's our choice. But live large for God and get excited about what God has for your life and don't slow down. And that goes with this last one, and it's important for us to understand. Go for broke. You know, but, but please, and for God's sake and for your sake, do steps one, two, and three before you get to number four. <laughs> please, that's important. The moral highways are, are littered with casualties who were simply going for broke. You, you know, and I remember in the, in the Army Ranger School, there was a time where they would... Is, the, our lunch happened to be chickens this one day. I, they did a lot of squirrely things in there. But this, this uh, land grader would stand up on top of this big cage thing, and he just reached down in there and start tossing these chickens out. And then everybody had to run and get their chicken, their, their lunch, okay? And these were stringy chickens. They, I think they were long-distance running chickens. But, <laughs> but he'd toss them all up, and then we'd go get these chickens, and then you'd have to kill them, you know? And they... And, and um, it was kind of interesting. It was humorous in one way. This, I had a guy, I may have told you the story, but I had a guy from a city somewhere. I don't remember. It seemed like it was on the East Coast, but I don't remember exactly. 
But he, he took, um, we weren't told how to kill these chickens. They didn't tell you what to do. I mean, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> they didn't tell us what to do. But, but this one guy filled up his canteen, this is no lie, with water and put that chicken under his arm and <laughs> 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 well, that was just an aside. That was <laughs> just the picture. I can't get it out of my mind. I'm sorry, Lord. I just... <laughs> But, but the one thing that was interesting about chickens is, you know, you can just wring their neck real easily, and, and that's the best way. But if you ever take their head off, and uh, which you could do that too to, to end them, you know, but, but uh, if you set down the chicken, they take off running, you know, and even with no head. And, and they, they'll just take off on you. And, and uh, it was interesting to me to watch that. In fact, I would encourage guys to do it just so I could watch it. And uh, I, I kind of swung mine around, but I let them do whatever they wanted. And it would flop all around. But it was almost like this chicken had more exuberance in those last few seconds of his life than it did before when it was sitting in the cage. It was all excited, you know, running into things. And then, bonk, you know, it, was, it would be the end. But that's what happens to us if, if we try to take step four without taking those first three. <laughs> we have to face up to the fact that, that we're not perfect. We have to live with our back to the past. We, we, we have to be a person who's forgiven by Jesus and has a worthwhile goal before we go for broke. And it doesn't mean that you're going to lead a perfect life. Paul acknowledged it himself. He said, I haven't accomplished it. But he was clothed in Christ's righteousness, and he was striving. I love this in, in 13b there in 14. You know, he, he, he says very clearly, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying. That's what going for broke is. It's pressing on for the upward call of God. And it's important for us to understand. You know, I, I, I went to bed early last night. Uh, usually, and early for me is like 8.30. So, I mean, I'm talking early, early for many people. But I always go to bed fairly early on Saturday nights anyway. And I knew that the Michigan State game was going to come on at like, what, 10.15 or 10.30 or something. How many State fans are out there? There's a few. And not very many. I'm surprised. Anyway, anyway. Uh, how many? No, I won't do it that way. But anyway, I was, <laughs> I was, uh, I, I was interested, you know, in, in the football game. So I got up around 12.30 and I... Uh, I went out uh, in the front room, and I turned on the TV, and they, they were losing the game. They were losing the football game. I thought, okay, well, that's good. No, not good. That's, that's okay. And so I went back to bed, and I didn't see the end of the football game. But this morning when I came in the office, I went out on ESPN.com, and I checked it out, and I saw the score in there. And they, they came back. Sparty came back and, and uh, pulled out a long field goal in the last minute of play and actually won the football game. And up to that point, it seems as though this year – the Michigan State University football team has found a way to lose some of the most incredible ways. I mean, they lost, a, I think, five games by a total of 13 points or something like that. There's some, they have just not been doing very well at the end. Well, they did it last night. They overwhelmed those difficulties, and they, they came back, and they won. They pressed on, and they won. You know, and if you want to succeed in this life, that's what's going to have to happen to us. You know, we have to, like Paul, grab a hold of his goal for our life with both hands and forget what's around us, forget what's behind us, and begin to press on toward that call with everything that we've got. We've got to understand that we've got to finish the game. We've got to drive through that finish line. You know, everything that you do in life, if you're into any kind of athletics at all, you always go through the object. You block through you, that defensive lineman, you know, you, you tackle through the guy with the ball. You run through the tape of the finish line. You never stop when you get that first hit, but you drive through. And that's how life needs to be. That we say, like Paul, we grab hold of that goal. And we are not going to let go. And so I don't know what you're looking for in 2013. I don't know how it's stacked up for you. But I can tell you this. If you look at these four simple steps... And you begin to say that, look, this year's going to matter for God. This year, I'm not going to spend my time looking into that rearview mirror, worrying about all the junk from the past that I've fallen into. Even if they were successes, I'm not going to live on my laurels and 
sit in my trophy room and gloat. No, I'm going to grab hold of the prize that God has for me, and I'm going to press through until I get there. And that's what we have to be about in this year that's coming. And it means sometimes that we're going to have to sacrifice. It means that there are times that we're going to have to just suck it up a little bit. You know, things aren't always going to go real well. Things are going to be tough. Sure they are. You know, they always are because life is hard. You know, the word says clearly in this world you will have trouble. It, it, It comes, okay? You don't have to go looking for it. It comes. But the point is, look through that. Look through those difficulties. Look into the face of God and just know that one day you'll be there for him. Why not make the days that we have, the days that we can get up and walk into that bathroom and fog that mirror, why not make them count for God? Why not? I mean, are they going to count for anything else? Because anything else that you do is vanity. You know, Solomon said it himself. It's all vanity. It doesn't matter for anything if it's not done for God. So can we just commit ourselves that regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in, no matter how difficult it seems, that we are driving through, we are driving through, that this is the year that we are going to see God. He's going to move in our lives. We're going to believe for that. We're going to get closer to him than we've ever been. And we're going to see God's hand upon our lives and upon those in our families. Can you believe that with me? Let's take a moment and pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, search our hearts. God, if we're we're living for ourselves, if somehow we have turned ourselves into a commodity and we're just kind of living this life, putting on airs and a show, God, check us up right now. Call us on the carpet. Help us to be a people, Lord, that are willing to admit that we're not perfect. Face, Lord, our inconsistencies and weaknesses. Admit them before God and receive your grace. And then, Lord, live for you with every ounce of strength that we have. God, find us there, I pray. Regardless of where we are in our circumstances, whether it's a tough time, Lord, or it's a great time, whether it's the road is rocky or smooth, regardless of ourselves, I pray that from this point, we are grabbing hold of you, Lord, and we are not letting go. And I pray that, Lord, each of us would find that prize, that we would see it before our eyes, just as Jesus endured the cross despising its shame because of the joy that was set before him. He looked beyond the cross. And Lord, let us look beyond our difficulties and right into the face of God and make our lives count for a bigger purpose than ones that we've had in the past. Lord, we're done with shallow living. We're, dis- we're deciding today that we're going to follow you. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, there might be somebody in this room that you've never asked Christ into your heart. That's the starting point. Unless you're willing to say, Jesus, I've messed up. I've sinned. I've done things my way and not yours, and, and I'm tired of it. Every time I do, I find myself right back where I started. I know it's a worthless quest, but for some reason, I seem to be repeating it. But today, things are going to be different. I'm asking you, Lord, to come into my heart, to come into my life, to take the controls, and I'm determined that I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life. If that's where you're at today, and you want to make that choice, the good news of the gospel is he's right here, right now. You don't have to run and look him up in the phone book. Jesus is here right now, knocking on the door of your heart, saying, let me come in. And if you will just turn and open that door, he'll come into you today. He'll do it for you. He'll forgive your sins. He'll give you a new life. He'll clean the slate. He'll do that for you if you give him your heart and determine that you're going to live for him. So this is your choice right now. That's the good news. He's just a prayer away. You say it, put words to it. He comes and he gives you a new start. That's what you're asking for. If that's you, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if there's someone here today and that's what you'd ask, you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I need him in my life and I know it. I don't want you to miss this last service of of 2012 without at least getting yourself in the right place to receive his grace in 2013. So if that's you and you'd say, pray for me, just lift your hand up real high right now with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Just lift it up, lift it up. Sure, there's hands going up, lift them up. Hold it up high. Let's just keep them up there before the Lord. This is it, man. Don't pass this moment by. If that's you, go for it. Take hold of it. Grab on. Say, Lord, take my heart. Those that lift your hands, just keep them up. And I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. 
I've made a mess of my life. And I'm sorry. And I ask you to forgive me. Let this day be a new day for me. And I ask you to come into my heart. Come into my life. Cleanse me from the inside out. Make me new. I'm yours, Lord. From this day forward, I am not going back. I'm going to follow you for the rest of my life and be with you for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank him for what he's done. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for new starts. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. If you prayed that prayer, you heard Pastor Bill, you need to be water baptized. You need to tell somebody what you did. Come see Pastor Carl, myself, after the service. We just want to get your name down, but we've got just one more thing we need to do here today. I'm going to ask Kim and Nate. Or Kim. Yeah, Kim and Nate. You guys come on up. Do you have your kids with you or no? Just the two of you? Okay, come on up here. These guys, let me tell you, God has been calling out. Different. Come on up here. Come on up here. God has called out different ones in this church from time to time to follow his call and to go into full-time ministry. This couple is no exception. They've been a real blessing here. They've been working with our youth. They've been working with our kids. They've been doing all kinds of things since they've been here, all along knowing that God had a call on their lives for ministry. And just in this past couple of weeks, they've accepted a position, and it's in White Cloud. White Cloud. White Cloud is that town when you're driving up, is it 37 that goes up that way? What's, this, what's the road that goes up there? I think it's 37. When you're driving up 37, they got a sign outside the town that says, where the north begins and the pure waters flow. <laughs> That's how I remember White Cloud. But I got to say that we want these guys to go in the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to send them out. So I'm going to invite, why don't you all stand up with me and I'm going to invite the elders and pastors and their wives to come on up here if you would. And we are excited. And I saw Pastor Ben is here. Where's Ben? Ben, you guys got to come up here too. Ben and Amber, they got to come up here. This is old home week. Get all these guys up here. But we want everyone to know that these guys are not leaving us. We are sending them. And we're sending them in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they know better than I do that without Him, Everything we do is for nothing, right? But in Him, there is nothing that's impossible to us. And so I believe that the Lord is going to use them to save young people in that area and that they're just going to flock to their youth groups and God is going to just set ablaze that whole area with the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray together. Extend a hand to them and let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we all admit that we're not perfect. We know, Lord, that we're just people. We do the best that we can, but we've realized for a long, long time that without you, everything that we attempt, Lord, is vain. It's all fruitless. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, miracles begin to happen. And so, Lord, I pray for your rich anointing on this couple as they've determined to lay down, Lord God, everything that's familiar and to run off into the ministry. God, I pray that you would go before them and prepare the way, that you'd remove every obstacle, Lord God, that you'd find the perfect home, that you'd already begin to send just the right friends for them and for their children, that, Lord, you'd surround them with grace, but more importantly, that your anointing, your power, power would be on them. That as they walk, Lord God, into this new mission field, that you would, Lord, allow yourself to be seen through them. That, Lord, everywhere they go, the Holy Spirit will go in front of them. And, Lord, he'll be drawing children and young people into the faith as a result. And, Lord, we're believing for miracles to take place. That you would confirm, Lord, the words that they speak with signs and wonders. And that you would be glorified. And we give you thanks for that, Lord. Surround them with grace. Surround them with gladness. I pray that the working of the ministry would be easy because it would be Jesus working through them. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.